Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure who Jack was talking about, but it was a really beautiful introduction. I hope I can live up to the, uh, uh, to the words that were spoken. And I'd like to thank Jack for inviting me here um, to the, give this talk this evening. Um, I'm really honored to be here. It's also my first talk in a year and a half with people in front of me. So that's also a pleasure. So it's a, a quite auspicious time. I did want to start off by just uh, acknowledging the passing of really a true genius in my mind, and that is Michael K. Williams, who passed away last week. Uh, he's not only an incredible actor, but he really was a humanitarian that gave back to his community in East Flatbush, as well as to Newark, New Jersey. Um, he struggled with demons that some of us have faced as well, and unfortunately, he lost the battle. So a uh, really wonderful man that we just lost, unfortunately. Um, I come from New Jersey, and I'm very proud of it. Um, as I get older, I realize where we came from plays a big part in our life. I'll try to explain some of that to you. You're probably too young to realize that now. You sort of go through life with your energy and zeal and zest, which is great. But at a certain age, you sort of reflect back to what it all meant. It's also where respect is not the norm. So in some sense, you have to struggle twice as hard. I always felt if you're from New Jersey. And that held me a good steed to overcome some of my struggles. Um, it's a place of juxtaposition, of contrast. It's beauty in different guises, forms, and materials. It's a beauty of ecology, but also very much a legacy of destruction. It has one of the biggest national parks in the country, and that is the Pine Barrens that you see in the upper right. Uh, it has New Jersey Turnpike, which I spent a lot of time, which I consider an engineering marvel, marvel. And as we drove through it, I was just in awe of how it was built and what it, re what it represented. But it's also a landscape of production and devastation, which is really what its reputation is about. That's good because if you live in New Jersey, nobody invades it because they don't want to go any further than what they see as the destruction. On the other hand, it's the bad rap that I mentioned before. So I found that the Turnpike was probably the most one of the first influential sculptures, and I ended up going to art school. Um, it is a linear sculpture of line, mass, lightness, and weight, um, and the sort of clover leaves and stuff were really uh, amazing um, constructions, both spatially, but also tactically and in the sense of light. And this is something that still today I'm fascinated by. So I live uh, four blocks from Gasworks Park. You've probably heard of it, the park that Rich Haig uh, did. Uh, I've traveled to many of them in Germany as well. And there's a certain industrial scale that we're just not replicating anymore. They have unique forms and a complexity that is really fascinating. So I think those early roots in New Jersey have sort of kept my passion for this type of landscape alive. You may share it as well. I know it's something that many students are looking at and fascinated by. Um, I also very much uh, look at the infrastructure and find a great beauty in it. So I think it's easy to dispense it for many, many reasons. There's no question those reasons are valid. But there's also a certain aesthetic that I find amazing, both in scale but also in the details of what it is, in the sense of the uh, I-5 bridge in Seattle on the left that you can see the truss work, and then, of course, just the light and shadow on the uh, clover leaf coming off I-5 as well. So um, I got into landscape architecture as a maker. I went to fine art school uh, for my first degree, and we made, and that's how we learned. But I spent some time um, in between high school and college uh, in New York City. And I lived in a New York City that you will never see. It was a New York City that resembled Dresden, and I mean that in all seriousness, than it did the New York City that you see today. This is the South Bronx, and basically the South Bronx, which is an enormous community of hundreds and hundreds of blocks, was burnt to the ground. It was burnt to the ground because the property values had declined to such a degree that the only way a landlord could get their money back from the insurance company was to burn it. And that's exactly what they did. Um, so it was a devastated landscape. It also taught me that um, there was a strong need for identity. And as their environment was destroyed around them, uh, broken promises, as you can see on the walls of the building here, people joined gangs. The gang predation at the time was immense. But they also thought about their background and their home country. And in that case, it was Puerto Rico. And they created these amazing gardens. <laughs> and I'm one of the few people, Martha Cooper, who you may know, a photographer from New York, also documented them. I have thousands of slides of this period. And it was a period of about 20 years. 
And these things were all over the Lower East Side, El Barrio, East Harlem, and South Bronx. And of course, if you drive by them, you could, yeah, you almost broke your neck, right? What the hell is that thing doing in the middle of New York City, right? And they were adaptations of a home memory. And it struck to me the importance of place and place attachment, that they felt so strongly and had been dormant for 20 years because the land wasn't available. But as soon as the land became available, this is what they created. And they were really um, incredible things to see but they were also incredible places to visit. And I spent three years documenting them, sitting in them, interviewing people, photographing them, because they were really places of empowerment. It was self-made community. The city could have given a blank about them. They were people of color. White flight had happened, so basically the people left were the Puerto Ricans and then African Americans, Native Americans, and others. And they formed their own places. These were social spaces, they were educational spaces, and they're places where culture was passed down. Here you can see this is a unique form of music called plena. If there's anybody here from Puerto Rico, you know it well. It's a folk music from Puerto Rico that's mainly a tambourine, a lot of percussion. And here they're teaching kids how to drum on plastic bottles. These are very poor people, so they didn't have a lot of resources. They scavenged them and created incredible places. So I bring that back to making, because all of a sudden I saw how people with nothing could make extraordinary places. And that uh, left a lasting impact. I also went to art school when uh, art was moving out of the studio, out of the gallery, and into the land. And I'm not saying that it was all necessarily perfect, because there were ecological issues to deal with, but it was also very evocative and provocative. And it was really where environmental art became an informer of offering new ways of seeing in that early practitioners initiated armatures that nature sculpted. And this is probably one of the most famous pieces, which is in Spiral Jetty, which is in the Great Salt Lake. And what Robert Smithson didn't know at the time is the rising and lowering of the lake created this phenomenon of salt crystallization. So that salt actually took over this armature. And of course, it wasn't revealed at times and then revealed at times. So nature actually animated the sculpture on its own. And uh, that was very profound for me to think about. Um, at its best, it's an integration of human and natural that magnifies forms, ecologies, and craft. Uh, this one you should certainly visit. You may have. Uh, it's very close to here. It's by uh, uh, Goldsworthy, Andrew Goldsworthy. Uh, and it's, I think, a marvelous piece because it's a play on the vernacular stone wall of New England, which is emblematic, right? It's the walls that the farmers used to divide the fields. The fields were 70 percent, the land was 70 percent farms. At the Civil War, it's now 70 percent forest. So these are remnant walls that you discover in the woods. He played with it as a serpentine shape, which a farmer would never do because it was about land ownership. So it's this wonderful emblematic way to play with culture. And at the bottom is a sketch of a James Terrell uh, project in Oslo. Let me try to read this. Uh, so craft as a reductionist pursuit engages a search for the essence. Using simple, thoughtful details elicits fascination, provides beauty, and brings meanings uh, into our projects. So one thing that fascinated me as an art student was detailing. And what I realized when I started teaching landscape architecture is it's something students rarely get to. They do schematic, they do conceptual, sometimes they do construction documentation, but really fleshing out a detail is something that seems to be lacking. And it's something that I'll address later in the talk in the work that I've tried to do. But I think it's very important of craft. These are some examples of projects that my students have done. So it's really analyzing what the function is, what the detail is, and how it represents both it culturally and functionally. Uh, at the top is a bench. We did uh, five benches, each for a significant woman in the city of Seattle. Um, the one at the, that's also on the right side. So they're very different forms because they're representing what those people were and what they did. And in the middle is a garden that is a Japanese-American garden. So we weren't trying to imitate Japanese culture, but we were influenced by it. And at the bottom, we're doing a project that I'll show you in Sweden that involves uh, steam bending wood like a uh, shipbuilding uh, technology, which is very prevalent in Sweden. Whoops, sorry. Whoops. There we go. 
So another influence, um, as Jack mentioned, um, is therapeutic environments. So also when you get to my age, I don't mean to sound like an old man, but I am an old man, um, you realize that certain events are transforming moments in your life. Not at the time necessarily, but in hindsight, they, they definitely are. And for that was the loss of my mother. Um, she died when I was fairly young of ovarian cancer. And it was a misdiagnosis because her doctor was an alcoholic and the team was all men. And it's a woman's disease. And they basically kept saying, you're fine, no problem, don't worry. By the time they opened up her stomach, they closed up and said, there's absolutely nothing we can do. She has about nine months to live. So uh, that was grim. Um, you know, I was fairly young and thought my mom would see my kids and see my successes, and that wasn't to be. But what I did do was spend a lot of time in a hospital taking care of her. And two things happened. One, how grim a hospital would be in Princeton, New Jersey, a very affluent town, I might point out. And it looked pretty much like this hallway. She has IVs coming out. The back of her uh, gown is open, so her naked ass is sticking out. I mean, everything was humiliating that you could possibly imagine. The smells were terrible. We're saying goodbye to each other under fluorescent lights in a public hallway because there's no private place to meet. Things are hopefully a little better than that now. The second thing was uh, she had a room and there was a tree, and it's just like the Roger Ulrich uh, study, if you know it, and I won't, quote it, won't go into it in detail, but she kept talking about this tree, talking about this tree. My mom liked nature, but she was a woman from Brooklyn, so nature wasn't paramount to her existence, right? And all of a sudden I realized that tree was the escape from the hospital and that nature was her way out. And then we would take drives in the country and she would just comment on the beauty of it. And it was the end of her life, so she was passing. But that was the thing that was most salient to her. And that, again, sort of determined the direction that I would go in. Another influencing factor was, I don't know how this ended up happening, but I got invited to Bosnia-Herzegovina shortly after the war. And you probably don't know much about this war either, but it was basically a war of ethnic cleansing. That means you are killed for who you are, not for what you did. If you're Muslim, you're dead. If you're Serbian, you're dead. If you're Catholic, you're dead. And that's the way it was. And uh, it was pretty traumatic to see, and the trauma was uh, so intense. So it had a complexity, an irony, a horror, but there was also resilience. There were certain amazing stories I heard about people that actually endured and cared. In fact, some people in Sarajevo now say, during the war, we never were more uh, generous and compassionate towards our fellow beings. Sad comment that it takes war to do that, isn't it? But now it's privatized, socialism is out, and everyone's just going for the next buck. So it's really transformed the culture, and I'm not saying that you want war there, but there was something actually learned from it. I was uh, able to go see a project uh, three years after the war. Uh, people were still, had no houses, it was totally bombed out. And this was a garden that was intended for food because people grew food. And once they lost the land, there was no food. So there was a food shortage and, of course, food insecurity and starvation. And what they realized was that this place actually brought people together. So the garden was a place where people dropped guard, questioned what they had been told by their leaders, and started to reassemble the community. <coughs> it was th non-threatening. It was safe. Uh, it was sensual. Um, they had shared activities. And all of a sudden, the person working next to you is not the enemy but you've been told for three, four years while the bombs went off, they were. And people were pretty gullible. They actually believed this until they worked in the garden. It also added normalcy. So war can become normal, but it's not typically a normal experience. But this was the experience of Sarajevo, which is where I worked. So it was bombed to oblivion for three years. You couldn't go out or go in except in a tunnel that went under the airport, and that was flooded half the year. And it was corruption, so you had to pay off people. You didn't have any money because you didn't have any work. On and on and on. But what they found was that this was very therapeutic because it gave them something normal, a routine that they could actually control because war is essentially non-control, as is a hospital experience. So Jack's right. Uh, we wrote a book about it, and a lot of the work that I do around the world now is therapeutic gardens. It's not something that's very common in many countries, so it's as new stages, but I think it's an area that landscape architects have a great purpose and a great role to play in. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about engagement with community. And um, one thing that 
Uh, how do I say this diplomatically? There's no way. Um, <laughs> designers can be very arrogant at times. And I'm not saying you are. I know you aren't. But some designers can be somewhat arrogant, right? So if you're designing for somebody in prison, what do you know about being in prison unless you've been in prison? And maybe some of you have, probably most of you haven't, right? How do you know? How do you know what it's like to die of cancer? Because when you have cancer, your identity is cancer. I've talked to cancer survivors and say, Daniel, I'm still a cancer survivor. I'm not a non-cancer person. It's an identity change. And my sense is you ask them. They are the experts, right? So to understand the other, uh, you have to come to the realization that they are not the other. So you can't ostracize them, but you have to respect them and find out exactly what their needs are and how they think. Overcoming our barriers to their understanding, because it's our barriers that are causing the problem. And adaptability to increase inclusion. And that means you have to get out of your comfort zone very often to find these people and talk to them. And I'll show you some projects where we did this. Yeah, there we go. Um, the other thing that I use is something that everyone calls it design build. And a friend of mine, Corey Gallo at the University of Mississippi said, why are we calling it design build? That sounds so pedantic, right? That's what companies do, right? I said, yeah, you're right. And he goes, what about exploratory build? I said, exactly, that's what we're trying to do, right? It's learning and teaching than just building. You may go off and do a career in design build, but I see this as exploratory building. And there's a reason why, and I'll explain it to you in a minute. So basically, it's comprehension through a process, an applied process. And this is how I really learned. And I'll tell you when I talk about drawing why that was so important. I just wasn't real good in the classroom. I mean, let's just leave it at that. So for me, doing was everything. It was my salvation, because it really got right to me. That's not true of everybody, but that was very much true for me. So really, I see design as listening to the input, Problem solving, understanding the implications of what you've designed, which most students don't. And you may not have to, but it's good if you do. Uh, realization of what that is, uh, the crafting of it, and then reflecting upon it. How could you have done it better? Was that the best thing to do? And this really, to me, is the process of exploratory building. So, <laughs> yeah, I go to some strange places, and this was one of them. This is a sculpture park in China that was about to be destroyed because the university that lurks right behind it wanted to take it over. And the Chinese government owns the university. So they wanted to eradicate this. This is 20 years of a sole individual's vision of a tribe that lived here in a fictional reality. So there were indigenous tribes that lived here, but they probably didn't build things like this. But in his mind of hallucinations, they did, and that's great. And uh, we were invited there to do a design build studio. And this is just a piece of it. There's a river going down. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, he developed the technique. It's based on old stack stone technique. And then they code it, and they put mosaics on it. And almost all the materials are recycled. The only thing that isn't is the actual, uh, actually it all is, because they're broken pavers that are from construction jobs. So all of this material is actually recycled. Uh, so in this one, we uh, were asked to come, and part of the project was to do tree houses. Uh, this is a park that people come and spend the day in, and there's um, some eating places, and then they see the wonderful sculptures, but there's a lot for kids to do, so we're asked to do this. So here you can see the steps. We're working with traditional masters using their techniques. So the students are doing the international to understand how different cultures build. It's become quite po popular now in Japan and even in America, but this is the traditional way that they built, which is burning the wood to preserve it. So we're burning the key pieces. Those are the ties between the three towers. Then we're framing the tower. And what's really unique is that this one is authentic to how the indigenous people built because it's pine bark shingles. Uh, it's very rare today, but it was the original way that it was built. And we were able to work aside these craftspeople and really understand their culture and the sustainability of how their culture actually operated at the time. Uh, we also worked with a master in the same project doing our own sculptures. 
Um, this is a Chinese ceramicist. It's a very similar technique to what I just described, uh, recycling. So this is a little bit of different design where you're not really setting a drawing and then actually replicating it in the field. You're designing as you go. So it's a much more organic process. Again, the students had to find the materials, salvage the materials, and then compose the figurative piece. So working with the master was important and also uh, developing their own aesthetic about what it would be. Uh, incidentally, two University of Massachusetts students were on this project with us. In Sweden, we also had a similar experience. Um, and this is really about respecting the culture and working with the culture, not bringing your dominant culture and saying, well, this is how we do it, so I guess that's how we'll do it. Uh, this is a spring house on the left. I'm sorry, some of the slides are faded out. I don't think that's going to be too good for the drawings, but it is what it is. Um, and they use a shingle on it. So the first thing the students did was learn how to hand make shingles. Where do they come from? How do you split the wood? How do you shave the wood? How do you taper the wood? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we spent two days doing that. And how do you build that of shingles? Well, you need a framework. So you build the framework because it's horizontal because the ver shingles are going vertically, and that's your nailer. And then eventually, we actually got an 18th century hand-making shingle machine and used that to make the shingles in the authentic style. And why they're authentic is because they're not even. So it's very different than a mechanized shingle that you would get today. They're very, very beautiful. We made um, 3,000 of them, I think. The machine broke constantly. So at midnight, we'd have to go fix the machine and keep the shingle production going. So yeah, there are some challenges with 18th century uh, technology. But it was a beautiful process. And ultimately, this is what we built. So the whole thing is shingled. Um, this is a sauna. And I'll describe it a little later in the project. So what I was talking about actually earlier was uh, this quote here. You don't learn to walk by following rules. You learn by doing and by falling over. So one thing that bothers me very often with students thinking and with professors' expectations is not to make mistakes. And in design build, you're encouraged to make mistakes because you are going to make mistakes. <laughs> I made them. You'll make them but that we address them and you learn from doing the mistake. And I'm a profound believer of that. So you need the safety net, you need the support, but um, it's how you overcome fear, and fear is the greatest obstacle. So this would be an example. Here's a wonderful idea, a very conventional treatment, uh, a, a bit of inspiration from bamboo baskets. This was for the Japanese project I told you about earlier. And all of a sudden, what is the techniques that are used in bamboo? It's weaving. So it's not actually uh, stacking and bolting. It's actually weaving. What does that suggest for form? And then ultimately, you have a much more interesting, I think, and dynamic design. And this is the project that's called the Kitsugi Garden. Um, incidentally, Kitsugi is an ancient Chinese uh, form of art. It means something is broken, and its healing process is actually more beautiful than it was, which is a beautiful concept. And all the paving, you can't see it very well in the photo, but down here you can see in the lower left, we used a bronze strip that maps the Japanese Americans' trips to Menendoka and other camps from Seattle as a way of stitching the plaza together to repair the insult and trauma that was imposed upon the Japanese Americans in the Northwest. So it was sort of all of a philosophy in the project. So I'm going to show you some projects and then get to the um, second part, which will be more about the drawings that I've done. But I wanted to show you some of our work. Uh, this one is in Seattle. We do a project every year in Seattle, a little different than your program. Most of our projects are off campus, mainly because our university is so bureaucratic, I can't stand working with them. But don't tell them that. Uh, not that all the clients are Dreamboat clients. Don't get me wrong. The VA was a bureaucratic entity that, yeah, I would think about working about again. But the work was super important. Why? Because veterans have many, many challenges that they face. Many of them have chronic pain. Many of them have PTSD. And those rates are higher now with the more recent wars. Uh, many of them suffer limb loss and other losses. Um, and then there's the harassment abuse that many women are suffering in the military. So there's an immense amount of need for healing within these environments and to do honor to the people that tried to give honor to our country. So we created this little garden. Wow, the color is pretty bizarre. But 
Um, it's a very thin, thin space, uh, very difficult and challenging to work with. Um, these are the drawings that the students did for it. Uh, it was an interesting project because when I first got there, I described to them we'd like to do a healing garden for the veterans coming home and for the veterans that were getting services at the VA. And they said, why do you need, we need a garden? I said, well, I think it's a good idea. They said, but we have a garden. I said, really, you have a garden? They said, yeah, let me show it to you. That's what they showed me on the lower left. Now you know who you're up against, right? They said, done. We even put irrigation in. What the hell are you irrigating? And I have no idea, but they literally said, this is our garden. We explained to them that most gardens have plants, most gardens have water, most gardens have birds, most gardens have native species, on and on and on. They said, oh, that's a great idea, sure. And the veterans raised the money and we were able to build the garden. So this is before on the left and this is after. And this is 10 weeks of construction. Um, 10 weeks, I, I, I think this one was 10 weeks design and construction actually, it was done in one quarter. So what's, it's in the middle of the uh, lobby, so it's the central point within the hospital. You know where it is, and that's very important. Many gardens and hospitals, you can't find them even if you know there's a garden. This one's right in the lobby at the front of the door. It also sets the tone of what the hospital is. It's a caring facility for people that uses nature. It's not necessarily true, it's a beautiful concept, but that was the idea that this is the first thing you see when you come into the hospital. A little different than visiting my mom when she was dying of cancer, I can assure you. Um, and the other thing was that there's many, many different user groups, so the students had to really address the complexity of that. You have patients, you have staff, you have visitors, you have rehabilitation going on. All of this is going on in that very, very small space that I showed you. It's called the Earth Sky Garden, because this is the sky room, it opens up to the sky and gets lots of light. And the one above it is called the earth room because it's very condensed and we planted a lot of evergreens and it feels more earthy and grounded. And those are the two sort of spectrums of the more public and the more private as well. Uh, this is the uh, earth room, again, the before and the after. Um, and this one is also used for physical therapy. So instead of working in a hermetically sealed gym, although that's probably what they're doing for COVID, you're working amidst a place of interest, wonder, fascination, et cetera, all the principles you would want for a therapeutic garden at no extra cost. And this was one of the patients out there, and I said, how do you like it? He goes, man, it's fantastic. And I don't know how much you know, because you're kind of young, but maybe some of you were in Iraq or some of you were in Afghanistan. When I grew up, guys came back from Vietnam, they fled New Jersey, went to places like Alaska and Idaho. And guys didn't really go to those places from Jersey. It wasn't like typical, right? And now I get it. They wanted to go where there was more nature than people. And that's very common with veterans. They actually seek out nature even before it's part of a program. So this garden was really hitting the spot right there. Very interestingly, when we did the interactions, they talked about the legacy of this, and a student of mine who's doing a PhD went back to the Civil War and found letters from veterans talking about the influences of nature. You probably don't know, but there were camps for veterans in the Civil War because one of the bigger killers was gonorrhea and syphilis, and they had camps. There's one actually in Vermont I visited. So they were in nature and in the woods, and these were typical treatment places for the military. And as you can see, there were different quotes that we pulled from that. It's very important because veterans really connect to the legacy of veterans. In fact, many veterans will only talk about really intense things with other veterans. They just don't feel comfortable with non-veterans. So that connection was important to support. And then, of course, the use of natural materials in a hospital is very important because most of it is glass, steel, and concrete a counterpoint to the harsh and unhealthy interiors. We also did a radiology garden. We did a second one. I don't know how, I, why I did it after the first. No, I won't go there. We'll just say that it was, uh, yeah, it was a hope that it would get better. Uh, this is for people who get radiation because right afterwards there's tremendous nausea before you go home. So it's a place to rest. And the one at the bottom is for the staff that are working 12 hours a day with very little rest, uh, working with pretty tragic consequences very often. We use the mobility of the swing very often. It seems to calm and reduce stress uh, very well. Um, and the staff really wanted that, so that was part of it. They also wanted to garden and grow vegetables, et cetera. So the two needs were very different, thus the two gardens are very responsive and different in that way. 
So uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the international projects now. Um, Jack's right, I wrote a book about design build, it's both for practice and for teaching, and um, your honored professor, Michael Davidson, is featured in the book as well. Some of the work from UMass is in that book, so if you get a chance, uh, pat yourself on the back and look at it. Um, yeah, great program you have here. So, uh, Jack, I mentioned Guatemala. This is the second project I did uh, study abroad. The first one was in Mexico, and this followed. And what you're looking at is the largest uh, dump in, South Amer in, Latin Amer in Central America. Uh, if you see the truck and you figure it out, that's about a 15-story building of garbage, okay? This is industrial, medical, and domestic waste, not separated. Uh, women used to come and put their babies in cardboard boxes while they salvaged what they could, and sometimes the boxes were bulldozed into the dump. And by the time they got the body out, it was bones because it's so acidic from the garbage itself. Um, the people uh, scavenge the garbage that they can and sell it to a broker. They're mainly women who fled, women and men, but most of them are women, frankly, fled the Highlands during a 30-year uh, war of genocide against indigenous people. So they knew how to farm, but there was no place to farm in Guatemala City, so they ended up as garbage pickers. Now you may say that's horrible, but when I talked to them, they were very proud of their job. And they actually connected it back to 16th century when rag picking was a profession. So they really said, yeah, I'm not doing too bad, I'm actually surviving, and others aren't, which was really interesting because it was pretty easy for us to snobbily say, who wants to be a garbage picker? That's at the bottom of the pack, right? They said, no, we have dignity. We're supporting our kids. We're going to give them a better life. So again, this sort of cultural prejudice, it's not so easy to let go of. You know, you knee jerk it. But it wasn't true at all. However, the conditions are harsh. Uh, that's a typical shack. Uh, they don't use cocaine or marijuana, even though there's a hell of a lot of it going through the country. They drink denatured alcohol. So if you go to a pharmacy, there'll be 500 of these bottles. They probably sell two or three a year for medicinal purposes. The rest they drink. That's how they get high. And if you know anything about denatured alcohol, if you drink too much, you go permanently blind. So they're playing with death every day, mainly the men. Um, the other problem is gang predation. So you've probably heard of Mara Santa Tucci or Mara Santa 13. These are gangs that are in New York and all over, but they started in Guatemala, El Salvador, et cetera, and they recruit very young people. And the families used to live in the dump. There was a fire there for months. It was a rubber fire. They had to evacuate the uh, dump. They were going to evacuate the city, and they banned families from living there. So now the parents, usually the women, go to the dump, and the kids are left at home, and the gangs recruit them. And if you're a guy, you have to kill a relative, and if you're a girl, you get gang raped. And I'm talking about 8, 12, 13. These are the kids. So the focus of our project was the kids. And it was to work with the families to try to provide them a stable existence and to give them a child experience because they're robbed of that. So there's no parks or playgrounds. Those have been taken over by the gangs or destroyed for the materials. So we created uh, three gardens in this um, school. Uh, two, well, two in this school and one another one. This was a courtyard in the front where parents could wait for their kids. It was also an outdoor classroom. It had a pollinator garden, a fragrant garden, and a children's playing garden. I'm going through them fast so I can show you some more, but this is the first project. It was a 10-week project, soup to nuts. And I can tell you from a construction standpoint, if you think digging is hard, try digging in a garbage dump. Try digging through a, a, what do you call it, a wire reinforced bra? Uh-uh. You just whack, 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 whack. And that's what we're digging through, is just garbage. So it was quite an experience to have to do all this, but the results were phenomenal. So this is the only safe place in the neighborhood. It's walled as security guard with a semi-automatic at the gate. And the children come here, and they're there for most of the day. They also get two meals a day. So, I mean, that's not unlike the United States. The second one we did was this play structure. Um, they didn't have a playground, as I said before. So this is a series of rooms on the bottom, on the top. They can run around, burn off energy. 
Uh, and each room is a different subject. So there's a math room, a history room, an insect room. So it is also uh, part and parcel connected with the curriculum that they have. And then finally, this is for the high school students. And it's a garden about conciliation and um, nonviolent practices because the kids are taught by their peers to default to violence, which will get them killed. So this is a place that they do both uh, environmental learning, but it's really focused, particularly the stage area, to have courses of, for the males predominantly, but for the females as well, of how to deal with conflict in a nonviolent manner. Peace Garden is really what it is. And these are some of the uses. Again, we use the bench swings. A lot of these kids have a plethora of problems, um, as you can imagine, uh, domestic violence, child rape, um, alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're quite troubled and distracted, and they really need a lot of support to make it through school. Uh, so I also, after Bosnia-Herzegovina, we did a pro two projects there. We uh, were invited to um, Friends Service, American Friends Service Committee was supporting those. They pulled out. And then somebody said, well, we were in the war, too. Would you like to come to Croatia? So I said, I heard Croatia has nice beaches. Why not? The food's fantastic and the people are wonderful. Yeah, what's not to like? And I fell in love with it, absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I'm sorry you can't see the drawings because these are drawings. I'm trying to intersperse the drawings because I draw all the time. It's how I get to know a place. I'll talk more about that, but I'm a little scared that the drawings are going to look a little weird. Uh, the second project we did was because a project fell apart at the last minute. And a good Croatian friend of mine that I've been working with said, I don't know, it's a long shot, but I know a psychiatric hospital on the island of Rob. Maybe they'd be interested. We have like two months. But it's August, and nobody does business in August. I said, what do you mean nobody does business? They're all at the beach. They don't answer their phone. He was right. So for 30 days, nothing. Finally get them in late August, and they go, yeah, we'd love to have you. So I scamper and put this whole thing together, and we arrive at um, the psychiatric hospital in Rob. It's a very interesting place because it was a former concentration camp for partisan soldiers. So the ghosts and the history in this place is absolutely amazing. It was built by the Italians, uh, and the Italians really didn't like the partisans. They weren't so pissed off at the Jews as the Germans were, but they really didn't like the partisans. So this was a great camp if you're a Jew to go because the conditions were much better. It was a terrible camp to go if you were a partisan, and many of them were exterminated there. It's a very small island in central, northern central Croatia, uh, and the buildings were then completed because they stopped it uh, towards the end of the war and never completed it, and the government uh, finished it. Um, this is a pretty intensive uh, psychiatric hospital. It's residential. Um, they have forensic psychi psychiatry, which is where you're sentenced by a judge. So these are people mainly who committed murder, but probably have some mental challenges that could be addressed. So they're sent here as well. So it was an intensive population. And then these are just quotes I put that some people would tell us while we were working. So I thought they sort of expressed that um, mental illness is super complicated and has a lot of stigma. And that doesn't change in Croatia. I'm sure many people in this room suffer from it. It's not unusual, but it's just not acknowledged, which is a real shame. Um, people are a little different, right? This guy lies on the middle of the walkway in an embryo position. That's how he feels comfortable. So what? Live with it. Why is he the problem? He's not doing anything. He's sleeping. Uh, this woman walks incessantly around and around. So Bill paths instead of roads, right? Accommodate them. Don't, don't be punitive. Or This guy weighs himself every day. I said, why is he weighing himself every day? He said, because he has no control over anything except for that. So that's what he does. Fine, right? These are benign activities that, in fact, may make them a little healthier if we just allow it. We couldn't work directly with them the first year, so we had to work with drawings. 
Uh, it was a little different. Uh, you can't see them that well. The one on the right, I still am not sure exactly what it was. It's a beautiful drawing, <laughs> but we couldn't quite interpret it. The rest of them were sort of theaters. They wanted Mick Jagger to come and, you know, all sorts of wild stuff. We said, a theater's a good idea. I don't know about you're going to get Mick Jagger tomorrow, but, yeah, we'll talk about that later. So we did a master plan because these are long-term projects. Most of my projects, I try to work six consecutive years because after the first year you finally figure out what the hell you're doing and the trust is built. So it takes time. So this was, we ended up doing five projects here. Uh, it's an area that was never built upon. It was the garbage dump for the camp. So we found all sorts of bizarre stuff in the dump. But you can see where the green, red line is. That's where the dump is. And then we did three projects there and another project uh, outside of the dump area. Uh, the first one was uh, outdoor gathering area. Um, they hang out a lot, smoke a lot, and want to be very social. It's also a performative space. So this is right next to the chapel. It's a very, very Catholic country, and they hold outdoor services out here in nature. Uh, it's a locust forest. You can sort of see it. Not great from these pictures. Um, and this was the first one we did. So this is all designed and built in 10 weeks. Um, What was interesting in this project is both the patients and the staff said, you have to build stone walls. We said, we do? They said, yeah, you have to. Really? Yeah, you have to. Why do we have to? Because that's what the islands of Croatia are about. There's thousands of stone walls on these islands. And they used them for cattle and sheep, and they're just everywhere. And they felt it was the vernacular thing that they missed in the hospital because it was built by Italians as a concentration camp, right? No stone walls. Sure, yeah, we'll build stone walls. How do we build stone walls? Bring in the masters. So we brought in a nonprofit that restores stone walls, and they gave us a workshop. You can see it up on the left. And then the students built, and then you can see at the end, uh, not only did we build stone walls, but we built a flat, uh, sandstone plaza uh, using all native stone in the technique that they use. Um, what's very interesting, and I'm not sure the university knew I was doing this, is we worked very closely with the patients. So part of the patient's therapy was to work with us. Not only did it benefit the students, but it benefited my students, because most of them hadn't worked really closely with people who have schizophrenia, bipolarism, massive depression, et cetera. And some did, and it was you know, challenging, and we had to talk about that at times. This is a master mason who was drafted at 17. His mother was Serbian, his father was Croatian, and they said, pick which side are you going to pick? I mean, it's right out of the Bible, right? He picked the Croatian. Basically, he said, I went to a village, and I didn't know it was children. They didn't tell me it was children. And he had been sent to exterminate, liquidate the children of the village. And he had horrible, horrible PTSD. And he was one of the sweetest men I've ever met. He showed up every day, and he wouldn't leave because he just wanted to be with us. He said, you know, I either go back and they're junkies or they have PTSD, and I don't want either one. I just want to work, right? So he would hang out with us all day. Really sweet guy. I've kept up with him. Uh, the second garden was really for uh, walking. Um, what's interesting about this garden is one of the student team said, do we have to work inside or can we go outside? I said, whatever you want. You want to go outside? Go outside. They went to the site, and immediately patients came. So where you design, which I had never thought about, is maybe as important as what you're designing because this gave access to the patients. This guy in the middle was a landscape contractor. He knew a hell of a lot about native plants, a hell of a lot about construction techniques, and they were all over it because they had access to it. They wouldn't go into the room where the students were working because they wouldn't feel they had a right to do so, right? This democratized the whole process. Really interesting, not something I had thought about. Um, I started the design build in part as a tool of empowerment. I have worked construction. I've seen how women were treated on construction sites or even walking by construction sites. I felt that being exposed to construction would be knowledge, and knowledge is power. So part of it is an empowerment to all people, but particularly for women because they're generally excluded from the trades or find it very difficult. It's also a great place where you can do mock-ups and test ideas. So usually when you do a drawing, you presume it's OK. The critics and, and visitors will tell you, maybe do this, maybe that. This, you just move it around until you find it, and then you can analyze why it works there. And finally, we do a lot of mock-ups for aerodynamic seeding. 
uh, people in the hospital had a lot of physical problems as well as mental problems. So the seeding was really critical. So we'd do them and test them with the patients until we pretty much got it right, or we thought we did. So this is the walking garden. Uh, it has also a stage. It has benches, bench swings, etc. cetera. Uh, it's used for dog therapy. It's uh, used for visiting very often. It's used for group therapy. They've really adapted this. It's one of their favorite places in the hospital. And then we also did uh, different types of seating. And one of them accommodated, as you can see in the upper right, the guy lying on the, on the uh, boardwalk, right? Why not do something that accommodates the embryo position? Because that seems to be how they want to sit instead of how we want to sit. And it's simply, you know, it's, it's great because it's super creative for the students to try to meet those challenges. The final project was a cognitive garden. Uh, this is mainly for the dementia population. They had different wards. One of them was dementia. So we created this cognitive pavilion. If you know anything about dementia, you can sort of plateau it a little, but you can't reverse it. Once the brain is gone, it's gone. So this was a way to slow down the process. Um, and they use the walking garden. They're integrated. We have musical therapy, physical recreation. And then we have weird seating again. And this is kind of an interesting story because we wanted seating that they could control. Uh, part of it in any hospital is you're told what to do, when to eat, when to go inside, when to go outside, blah, 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 blah. You lose all sense of personal identity and personal um, confidence. So these things we designed, then we said, how the hell are we going to build them? They have to be light. Turns out one of the world's biggest yacht builders was down the street. And the director of the hospital called and said, we have these students, they have this crazy idea, maybe you could help, you do fiberglass. He helped us fiberglass this whole thing for free. So we just used a local technology that just kind of worked out. I'm not saying it was planned. And it was really great because we were able to use this local expert at it. So quickly, I'll go through Sweden and then try to go through um, the drawings. And then we'll um, uh, uh, call it a night uh, or we'll have the reception. So uh, we did go to Sweden. This is where I've been most recently. Um, I thought this was a great quote. Whatever future may have been in store, one thing is certain. Unless local communal life can be restored, the public cannot adequately solve its most urgent problems to find an identity itself. As you may know, Sweden has taken the second most uh, Syrian refugees than any country in Europe, Germany being the most. So they have a huge influx of Syrian refugees. And Sweden, being a practical country as it is, said, don't send them to the city because we're losing everybody in the country. Send them to the country. So they send them to these really remote parts of Sweden. Many of them are from Aleppo and cities, and they're urban people, and they don't know what the hell is going on in these places. So it's, it's been really interesting. Um, one of the challenging is the traditions, an opportunity to redefine and accept fluidity as an asset. So how does a refugee work, and how do we work with them in this unknown space that they're in? It's really a parallel existence, not a shared exchange. So they exist, but they're not integrating and not communicating and not socializing. And there's culturally defined uh, patterns that may cause conflict and prevent integration. For instance, the Syrians gathered down here where you see that concrete thing. They gathered a lot because they cooked out a lot. They had amazing food. The Swedes hung out where the trees are because they thought it was more pretty. Because the Swedes hung out there, the Syrians said, that's not our area. We can't hang out there. And they wouldn't. So they're relegated here. It was just a natural sort of uh, segregation. So we did the whole process working with the community, talking with them. Uh, the Swedes were shy. At, I mean, the, the Syrians were shy at first. And you have to understand there's a power dynamic here. The refugees are not necessarily happy with the situation, but they feel so lucky and so thankful they don't want to challenge the situation. <laughs> so we're challenging the situation, but we don't want to misrepresent their needs. And it took two years to really be able to communicate. That's what I'm talking about time. At first, they just kind of look. Bashir, the guy you see right there, was the leader, and his job was to work with the community. It was a little easier with him, but others just simply wouldn't talk. There's also gender issues. So very often, women didn't feel comfortable talking to a man. So you had to be sensitive about that. So it was a fascinating, fascinating um, project in that respect. Uh, so what we did is we um, talked to them. And the Swedes were really determined that we do a sauna. It's Swedish tradition, right? That's what we live for. The weird thing is they do saunas in the winter. How do we explain this to the Syrians? 
We explain what? We explain what? Finally, the guy looks at me and goes, you mean Turkish bath? He said, yeah, like a Turkish bath. We love Turkish bath. So it's really a language issue, right? So they bought into it, but there were definitely some profound differences around it. Um, we also did a master plan for the site. So the first phase, we did the sauna, kitchen, and garden in between. You can see the garden. That's the kitchen. That's the inside of the sauna. Again, is a 10-week project. Um, but there was a problem. And if you see the little red line, that's the problem. The Syrians didn't use the sauna as much as they used the kitchen. They loved to cook and eat. And the Swedes liked the sauna, but the Swedes sauna naked. So you see the red line? You get my picture? That was a problem. <laughs> and it was a problem we should have figured out ahead of time, but we didn't. Yeah, we're not infallible. So we went back a second year, and we had a long discussion with them. And we understood where we failed. And we solved it. So here you can see there's a privacy screen. You go around the sauna. You come out to this dock away from the garden area. And you can swim as naked as you want. But you're not disturbing those who are using that space. So this is the importance of these long-term partnerships. They didn't like coming down the hill, the Swedes, in the winter because it was slippery. So we built the staircase. The Syrians wouldn't come unless they could bring the entire family and stay for an entire day. What about the kids? Good point. We'll, we'll create a kid space. Now the place is absolutely packed. But it takes that time to understand and to accept your, your fallibilities. You know, we made a mistake. We screwed up. Let's correct it, not walk away and leave it to them. Let's correct it. And that's what we were able to do. So it was a wonderful experience. I draw because it was the only thing I could do. I mean, when I say I really didn't do well in school, I mean I really didn't do well in school. They put me in the classes, and in those days, we called them for the retarded kids, right? And when you go to a class and you're told it's for retarded kids, you pretty much figure out in the long run you're pretty retarded, right? I mean, I don't like to use that word, and I know it's not cool now, but I'm just trying to explain New Jersey in the 1960s, right? I failed every foreign language. I took eight of them, and they couldn't figure out that I had dyslexia, right? I just ship them to the next one. It's somebody else's problem. But what I could do is I could draw. And I just kept drawing and drawing and drawing. And because I'm from New Jersey, I had this determination. I said, I'm going to screw them with my drawing. And I, yeah, I kind of did that, right? It was like, if I can't do that, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it damn well because I couldn't do the rest. I mean, it's kind of ironic that I'm a professor, given that background, I agree. But I think there's other people like me. I mean, it was just really, really hard. It just didn't work. I ended up dropping out of college and I had an apprenticeship for three years. And I learned everything hands on. I learned painting uh, conservation, casting concrete, um, frame construction, silkscreen printing professionally, all of that stuff. And it just came so easy to me. And the struggle in the classroom was so, so difficult. So from a very, very early age, that's what I did. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry about the quality. But these are pen and ink drawings that um, I've done. And I thought this was a great quote. The act of depicting something disciplines and strengthens the attention, obliging us to cover the whole of the phenomenon studied and preventing, therefore, details from escaping our attention, which are frequently unnoticed in ordinary observation. So to me, it's not just rendering. It's observing phenomena, observing form, mass, textures. All. This is all what informs design, right? I mean, it's all out there, so you just have to observe it. Where you want to observe it is up to you. So I think this. Taking time, and particularly now to me, and you may not agree with me, taking time to observe is almost a luxury, but it's also a necessity. And you cannot do that looking at photos on the internet. I'm just sorry. It doesn't happen like that. Because you're witnessing the change and trying to capture it while it's happening. That's phenomenology. And that's not what the internet really provides us with. Interesting, this is the father of modern neurobiology. And he asked all of his medical students to take drawing and painting classes because of the observational skills that they would uh, learn. So I was sitting around um, during the epidemic, uh, pandemic, and uh, you know, teaching was a little slow. You do your Zoom thing and stuff. And I just needed to do something. So I was reverted back to what I've always done, and that was walking and drawing. So I just started walking around the neighborhood documenting what I saw. Stows, stores closed down, massive amounts. Uh, houses being torn down. 
because in Seattle, ironically, while we're having the pandemic, the building boom is going on and gentrification is full steam and we have this homeless problem that is growing and growing and growing. Trucks that people are living in. So the working poor are also living in these conditions. And I work out with them. We have a guy at our gym. I talked to him. I said, you live in your car. What's going on? He says, man, I can't afford a place, but I work every day. And he was pissed off for people who didn't work. But he lived in his car because he just couldn't afford anything. And then the communities and other things that grow around that. So it got me out of the house. I was home for a long time because I couldn't travel. I got to know my neighborhood. And I found these odd things that to me were sort of wonder, were stories, not wonderful stories, but stories. Like, where did this thing come from? What happened? Is it an eviction? Is it a divorce? Is it what? And, you know, I would find these all over, just stuff in the streets that I don't think happened before. So it was sort of the story that wasn't told became a story that anyone could tell just by the documentation of these things. Uh, so I would go to places that I hadn't spent a lot of time in, and you may have a question, what's it like? Well, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in, uh, yeah, pretty messed up areas. Um, I'm not scared, because I've done a lot of stuff myself, so I'm generally not scared, but it can be scary. And the reason is a lot of it is mental health, and some of them are not taking their medications. So I did one drawing where a guy started circling me with a bent fork that he had been stabbing everything in sight. And I tried to talk him out of it, and eventually he sort of left. But a friend said later his friend had just been stabbed by the same guy downtown. So you're working with populations, but I also respect them. And I try to talk to them because you're on their turf. And I've had many people question me and saying, aren't you documenting something you shouldn't because it's my life? And I'll say, if you want me to stop, I'll stop not a problem. But what I'm doing is trying to record an event in time. I'm very empathetic to where you're at, and I will do what I can to help you, but I'm not here to violate you in any form or manner. And that's how we negotiate. And I've heard tons of stories because of that. I did have, in this middle project here, a woman scream at me relentlessly, and I just left, because it was clearly disrupting her. So you have to know when it's OK and when it's not OK. I mean, that's kind of like any other drawing thing, but in this case, it's kind of loaded because of the, um, yeah, the table has been turned in many respects. Uh, so I also learned that I-5 is the biggest housing shelter. This is what one of the homeless people told me. He said, don't you know this is the biggest housing sh shelter in the, West, in the United States? And then experts have confirmed that with me. So this goes from LA to Vancouver, BC. And these are all sites along it. I'm only doing the Seattle and the Portland part, but it is massive amounts of people living under there. You also may know that Seattle is a seismic zone. So if this thing collapses, there's going to be tons of people under there. However, DOT allows people to camp there. And frankly, if they didn't camp there, I don't know where they would. I'll show you the other places they are, but those are getting closed down now as the pandemic starts to subside. Um, it's a weird thing because as I paint and draw, it's sort of a balance of landscape. There is a beauty there. There's definitely a despair there. And there's a sense of failure there. A, for me, a collective sense that we have failed. And I'll tell you why. In Croatia, it's 40% unemployment. And you don't see people on the street. It's a vestige of a socialist system. In a socialist system, everyone has a right to housing. Croatia wasn't fantastically rich like the United States, but they did it. And people still long for the old days of Tito and socialism. That's changing now, and I don't know if there's more homelessness there now. But there are ways that we can, I think, address this. We're just not willing to. For instance, Amazon wouldn't pay a .000015 tax on their employees in Seattle. They threatened to move. So we're talking about chump change, right? So it seems to me there would be ways to solve this, but I'm not an expert. Um, and I see it as a witness of a time. It's part of a tradition that you'll find. Um, the Ashcan School did a lot of this. Other artists have done this. It's a sort of legacy of documenting a point in time, particularly uh, Hoovervilles and things like that that were popular during the Depression in both murals and in sketching. And there's also typologies. So in Seattle, um, the parks were taken over pretty much by homeless. 
to the degree that they weren't being able to be used by other I mean, you could physically use it, but it was so uncomfortable people weren't using it. Uh, this is beginning to change, and there's been some clearances, which pushes them further into dangerous situations, such as the margins of I-5, where if you take the wrong step, you're going to be clobbered by a car doing 70 miles an hour, right? So the Parks Department for a while had a no-evict strategy, and now they seem to be changing that. Ironically, I was just in New York City, and I didn't see a homeless person in a park. So New York has a totally different policy. And I don't know where to, you know, where to stand. I mean, I get a lot of chat on stuff when I put it on Facebook, and you know, Portland is like, will allow anything to happen, and now people are leaving Portland saying, I've had enough of it. So where is the balance in this that all people have access or all people have um, a right? Streets, um, these are some of the, this is the one where the guy was circling me on the left, but um, in this case in Portland, they've completely taken over the sidewalk. So you can't walk on that sidewalk. That's right next to a park that they weren't in. I don't know why they weren't in there. There must have been some covenant around that park. So as you start to demark the landscape, you begin to see these patterns, as you would in any landscape analysis, right? But this is sort of how people use space and how people live in space when they have no abode. Um, overpasses, these are very big in Seattle. So these are over I-5 for the most part. I was documenting this one in Portland, and a guy comes out to me, he goes, hey, what you doing, man? I said, I'm drawing. He goes, yeah, I draw. He said, really? He says, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, but they stole all my art. But I see, you want to do an exchange? He said, yeah, we can do an exchange. You give me yours, I'll give you mine. That sounds great. So he runs into that thing, which is blue tarps and tents and you know, a lot of people, needles and stuff. And he comes out and he gives me this uh, drawing he did, which is a really beautiful drawing, right? And then he says, uh, what's your name? I said, Dan. I said, what's your name? He says, Space. And walked away. And there's just these moments like that that are kind of magical, right? That these people, he told me his whole story he came from Honduras, I think. It was on and on and on and on. But those are the conversations that you can have that are really illuminating. Then I went back to find him because I was giving him my drawing. And... It was pretty much a drug den, and space wasn't around, and you realized the chaos and trying to locate somebody, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's an interesting world. Uh, underpasses are predominantly uh, the most popular, mainly because of the inclement weather we have in Seattle. And I will say that in talking to many of them, Seattle is a destination because of our social services. So we're known nationally for having pretty good access to social services. And then there's these that are sanctioned homeless camps that move around the city. This one happens to be right near the university. We've had it on the university. They're kind of an odd, but they are self-community places. So the, the homeless all have jobs and tasks to maintain these, police these, et cetera. So they're sanctioned sites. We don't have enough of them. Um, they move around the city in mass and sometimes they're really stretched to have one. Um, the addiction is, is very rampant. Um, when I walk on some of these sites, I'm pretty much walking on needles, not stone or paving. Um, wear good shoes, um, and we're in a, 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 what do you call it, fentanyl epidemic in Seattle, and uh, it, it's really crazy. So, um, but that's not all of them. And, and I found that, you know, there's the homeless living in cars and RVs, uh, couples and families in RVs, it's more of the tent encampments that sort of fall apart because the addiction just becomes too paramount um, are more the common ones. Um, these are some of them. This is the reverse of this tent. Uh, I was doing this and a person came up and said, where's Mary? I said, Mary? I said, yeah, that's Mary's tent. I said, I don't know where Mary is. And I expect they may have OD'd a couple of times I've found that. So there is, you know, yeah, the tragedy of the whole thing for sure. Uh, there's some that just want to be alone, that want nothing to do with a group. This is not untypical of severe mental illness, schizophrenia, where paranoia is huge. This is the entry to a community center in Green Lake. And they just appropriated it because it has an overhang. That's a bonus, right? You want the overhang. 
Uh, this one is a, a ballpark that's a backstop in a park, and they just sort of claimed it. So it was kind of, it was interesting at the beginning of the pandemic because people weren't using parks. They didn't know if they should. Then they really started using parks, and it became this contested terrain because of that. But they are homes, and probably one of the most touching thing is you know, when you're there, you see the collection of stuff. Like, what would you do if you suddenly got kicked out? What would you take with you that could fit in a car, that could fit in a tent, that could fit in an RV? What would it be? And then how do you keep it safe, right? Space told me all his drawings were stolen. So the, the problems that these people face is almost like superhuman to think that they can even exist, right? They have to get propane for the things. This is their kitchen. The propane tanks blow up. There's a fire. I mean, you'll see scorched sites all throughout the city. Um, this one, I still, I wasn't able to talk to them. They have their boat hooked up to the back of their RV. The RV is completely falling apart, but they still want that boat there. What was the connection? Was that their grandparents' boat? Was that their parents' boat? I don't know. I mean, these are narratives that you will never, I'll never know. But they're very poignant. At least I find them very poignant. And then this was a great one. This is homelessness protest. I don't know if you can see it, but it says, save the tree. So they built their house around this tree and then <laughs> marked it. It's under I-5. Um, I found out, actually, that there was a fire here about a month after I did it. So I don't know if that site is still there. Um, so I'm not trying to, I mean, a drawing is, is is not a photograph, right? It's an interpretation. And I just thought that this was a great quote. It's just at the Cezanne show. Sketching is not only a record of what the artist saw, but also the experience of seeing, reflecting the ever-changing nature of perception. They make visible the process of drawing, searching pencil lines multiply, repeat, twist, and tremble. Transparent washes of watercolor capture fleeting effects of light and shadow areas of unpainted paper conveying presence as much as absence. So it's as much about drawing. Um, I mean, I do, I'm going to Denver to do a workshop all about drawing. So, you know, how loose should you be and not true to what is there? How much should the light become a phenomenon that is not true to there? So it's not factual, but it is a point and place and time, at least for me. And then it's phenomenology. So unfortunately, this thing is blurred out, but it was all about the light on that ramp. It brings me back to my beginning about New Jersey and the turnpike. So I was going to do a homeless camp. The woman yelled and kicked me out. I'm walking back to my car and I see this like, oh my God, that's beautiful. I got to capture that. So <laughs> it never uh, disappears. So here's Danny's tips for uh, uh, drawing. First one is do it. Second one is do it a lot. You will get better and better and therefore keep doing it. Uh, you must accept, love, and explore your hand as it's unique. Many people struggle, right? Your hand shakes all the time. That's your unique expression. So you just have to let it happen. Don't fight it. That is you. There's no right of way. There's your way. So whatever you want to do is what you're going to do because that's what you're passionate about. Beg, borrow, and steal. Art is like a grapevine. Picking the sweetest grape offers the greatest fulfillment. So you, you know, when I was a kid, all I did was look mainly at Van Gogh, and take everything I could get from him. That's how you're going to learn. I mean, there's you know, nothing wrong. Have fun, don't be shy or be shy, but explore the world as it's your oyster. So many of these people that I work with really gravitate and have discussions with me, and those that don't express it pretty easily. Many of them have been artists and like to talk about art, actually. And uh, it's been a sort of nexus and entree into their stories. Um, get frustrated, kick a can, and move on. The joy is worth it. There are many paintings and drawings I've done that bit the dust. I pushed it too far, as one is I want to do. So, you know, okay, get over it and do another one. That's the beauty of it. You can continue to do it. So, yeah, that is it. And thank you for your time. And if we have time for questions... And I'm sorry about the buttons you can see, but I can't see anything here, so I'm sort of grappling around.